I said uh, earlier uh, to a young woman who works uh, diligently here in and around Rutgers, devoted to the city of Newark, that I'm nervous that the 30-somethings who are taking their leadership responsibility in Newark now uh, don't have the benefit until now of what is revealed in this volume. I don't want to uh, embarrass the, the editors. But I will say they have done a yeoman's job of uh, cataloging uh, what is vital for us if we are to forge a really progressive new future, continue forging a progressive new future for this city. Um, in many ways, when I read this book, I, and I urge you to think about these analogies when you plow through it, for those of you who haven't read it. I, the images, there are two images, is that Ken Gibson and those working closely with him were like people drinking from a fire hose. And, and I, I, I think about that because of the expectations of the masses of Ken Gibson's supporters, people marginalized by so many variables, and what they expected of this mayor, uh, not just expected over time, but a couple of days after the election. Incident. And on the other hand, to uh, uh, sort of paraphrase uh, or utilize unfairly that, that well-known expression, uh, Gil Scott Heron, that the revolution will not be televised, right? Well, the revolution will not be brought on by a single election. And I think Ken Gibson faced the lack of real understanding on the part of people whose, whose lives were urgently on the edge, and not really understanding that, not understanding, for example, that Newark is not an island. And a city with great needs would have to reach beyond its borders for help. And uh, that thing about uh, uh, him being a mayor for all the people didn't resonate, resonate so, what do you say, uh, resonate so much uh, to the people living in high rise apartments, people who were struggling with life. But he had to contend with this. Uh, do you have a, a, a palpable sense of those days of high expectations imposed upon the limits? Because as I read the reflection, I'm reminded of the fable of the six blind men and the elephant. You, you, you read all of these different views of Ken Gibson and as the fable suggests, it really depended on where you touched him that defined how you saw him. And that's why having all of these voices together is a brilliant stroke. I mean, well, Expectations, Bill, limitations. So perhaps I can pick up the theme where you use the word fable. A Greek fabulist, Aesop, once said, he who seeks to please everyone did not care that a particular constituency, even those who got him into that office, might have been displeased with that. For him, all the people is symbolic, I think, of the word, my city of Newark. So when we say a mayor for all the people, I don't think Ken was naive about Aesop's theme that you can't please everyone. He was comfortable with not pleasing anyone so long as he was taking care of his city. And I think that gesture summarizes his legacy as well as I can uh, in terms of what his commitment was to the city of Newark. So Richard, why, why, how did you and Bob decide to go about establishing this record in the way that you did? Uh, it's an uh, interesting development. Actually, the um, germ of this idea originated with uh, Bob Holmes and the guy by the name of George Hampton. Mm -hmm. 
uh, they were discussing a guy by the name of George Hampton. Yeah, a guy by the name of George Hampton. <laughs> they were discussing um, what might be done to begin to address some of the more critical commentary that um, uh, was prevalent in the conversation about Newark. And uh, I got involved in this conversation over the course of uh, a glass of wine or a bottle of beer at uh, the steakhouse on Route 21 here in Newark. Uh, and the, dis the decision moved in the direction of writing an article for a major magazine like Governing to talk about what had happened so almost 50 years ago now, that is, the tenure of Ken Gibson, the first African-American mayor of this city, who strove to uh, infuse it with economic help, if you will, to respond to some of the uh, uh, challenges that the people who happened to be marginal marginalized were uh, addressing at the time. And that conversation uh, continued uh, leading to us deciding that perhaps the best way to go about writing about that period would be to enlist the involvement of others who were active in the city, either as a part of the administration or critics of the administration or friends of the administration to, to get a cross-section of views about what actually happened during the period that Ken Gibson was mayor. Um, we were going to produce a volume that we would publish ourselves. Uh, we would self-publish this document, we thought. And to our surprise, uh, it was suggested that we reach out to Rutgers University Press uh, to determine its interest in uh, uh, taking the lead in publishing the volume. And uh, quite frankly, Bob and I were even more surprised when they said they wanted to, uh, to run with it. They thought it was a terrific idea. So that's how it began. Uh, and over the course of two years, we recruited, Bob can add to this, we recruited some 44 individuals who we asked to chat in writing about their experience in Newark during the period that Ken Gibson was mayor, during his first term, his second term, his third term, and his fourth term. We asked them to write from their perspective about things they felt were important, about their relationship to Ken, about their individual involvement in the city, uh, their uh, hopes for the city at that time, their expectations, and their um, sense of, of failure, if you will. Uh, the course of, uh, over the course of those two years, we were able to convince 44 people that they should join us in this project. Mm -hmm. We are the collective memory of the time. So as you read it, don't read it as a book of just about Ken Gibson, but a book about the time that Ken Gibson served as mayor, the place, place. in which Ken Gibson served as mayor, through mm. the voices and the eyes of the many people that we got to talk about it, people like Dave Dennison, who was really right in the core of that uh, administration during that period, Junius Williams and others who contributed to this volume. Marie Villani, I can't, uh, so s delighted to see you, mm -hmm. who was there on the council trying to support him while she sat between the White Council and the African American Council and found herself as the one woman that had to somehow bridge that gap. The voices are extraordinary. Uh, so it's the collective memory that we, we <laughs> hope to capture about the man, the time, and the place all in one volume. See, one, one thing I thought about knowing these gentlemen is uh, getting a group of uh, engaged citizens to give their own perspectives on Gibson uh, would relieve them of responsibility for letting us know what they think. So I'm going to push them a little bit <laughs> to, since they've been privy to all the material uh, and they've digested it beautifully, to do some speculation and some opining on certain aspects. Now, one, one of the things that pops up in the book is this debate about Ken's personality. He was uh, notoriously low-key and deliberate. Um, and on the other hand, there were people who thought, in hindsight, maybe even in foresight, Newark needed a, forgive my bias, a firebrand. 
charismatic person. Um, and there were people who wrote who felt positive about Ken's uh, style, and there were those who <coughs> wondered what might have been had he been more, uh, I think you even used, or someone used, the term like uh, a Jesse Jackson or Al Sharpton. I'm not making that up, it's in the book. <laughs> so uh, would you say a few words about that? Because uh, it is an ingredient in what was accomplished sure. or not. Yeah, I, I think the, um, the press, especially the New York Times, led uh, in the conversation about Ken's personality, that he was very low-keyed, that he was laid back, reserved. In fact, I think you know, they said he was phlegmatic, if you will. Um, that, I think, was intended to be a backhanded compliment to the mayor, uh, because I think uh, others came to the conclusion that Ken's quietness, if you will, was an advantage uh, for a city that had just three years prior to that experience experienced the, one of the largest uh, and most uh, traumatic uh, citizen rebellions in the country. So having someone who could, if you will, stabilize uh, the, the residents of this, this community, uh, those who were very much concerned about what they had not been allowed to participate in, the, the city's economy, the workforce, uh, in government, and those who were protecting, if you will, uh, the power and resources they had been able to see the school, the public schools improve to the, to the extent that their children might benefit from it, that they would participate more effectively in government. So his personality worked uh, for a group of people who were concerned about bringing those different communities together. For those who felt, however, that uh, electing a black mayor implied that there, were, there, there was a new um, day in Newark, that there would be uh, a, a dramatic change in the, the lifestyle, in the quality of life, in the, in the uh, conduct of business. And some felt that Ken's style did not allow for that to be realized. You want to add? One thing, a name that comes to mind, a contributor to the book, the late Al Copy, suggests that Ken's strength was underestimated. And he puts it in this context. He said he was a mayor who came downtown to the business community and introduced himself as one of the CEOs in this town. He is the chief executive officer of a municipal corporation known as the city of Newark and stood toe to toe with the CEOs of Prudential, PSE, and G, and all of the others. And Al Copy thought he was one of the first to take the mayor's office and put it in that context, that he too was a chief executive officer who should be respected and it made a huge difference in the city because those major corporations were important to the revitalization of the city. So he may have been laid back and quiet, but people like Al Copy tell us in the book that he was no, he was no uh, shrinking violet. He could stand his ground and he could stand his ground with the best of them. People expected change. How do you understand change? I mean, are we not still living in an era greatly influenced by Ken Gibson on a trajectory of change that occurs over a generation or more? Uh, is that too polite? Uh, because, you know, Richard, you, you articulate some pretty impressive things that were accomplished that were initiated in those days. Yeah, I, I think uh, the mayor does not get as much credit as he should for uh, maybe three or four uh, principal things, and Bob will add to this, I'm sure. Uh, the first of which is the extent to which um, he was able to enlist the involvement and the participation of young African-American and, dare I say, majority uh, public policy uh, ab ab uh, aficionados, if you will, who wanted to participate in uh, the rebuilding of Newark led by an African-American mayor. He inspired these young people. They came from some of the most uh, prestigious institutions uh, in the country, from Yale and Harvard and Princeton and Rutgers and Seton Hall and you name it. Uh, 
these young men, primarily young men, by the way, uh, uh, became a part of his administration. They worked in the nonprofit organizations that supported uh, government services. So that was a contribution that doesn't, in my view, get as much attention as it should have. Many of those young men have moved on to very prominent positions uh, in important places so, so across. They they are alumni of Gibson University. Of Gibson University. Let's talk a little bit about that and, and the place of these alumni today and how that is relevant to where Newark is today. I think I coined that phrase, Gibson <laughs> yeah, University, yeah, you did. feeling that, I, you, <laughs> that yeah. I am one of the, the graduates of that uh, distinguished university known as Gibson University. I think it's uh, Dan O'Flaherty's piece that reminds us Dr. Howard, that having change is like watching grass grow. Yeah. You've got to be very yes. patient, yes. and you have to look at it from a distance, perhaps. If you stand there and watch it, you probably won't notice the paint dry or the grass grow. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be the legacy of Ken Gibson. We have to continue to evaluate it over time, looking back at it, and how it has affected things we see today. I researched how historians determine whether <laughs> a person is an historic figure. It's those who leave traces of themselves mm. behind. And mm. to your metaphor that Sharp James used, those who lay the foundation for others to build upon. And upon those tests, Ken Gibson wins hands down. He is clearly an historic figure because he satisfies all of those tests for what an historic figure needs to be. I might add, though, that my, I think what I learned from the historians best describing Ken when they were asked who they thought the most prominent and important mayor of all time would be, would be, they named Fiorello LaGuardia of New York City. Why? For his programs and policies? No. It's because he changed the perception of what an Italian might be in a leadership role. Mm -hmm. There was a misperception that you were Cosa Nostra and Mafia. You were not going to be a mayor. Fiorello LaGuardia changed that perception. Ken Gibson had a much more difficult challenge to, say, to change the perception of what African Americans could do in a leadership role. Yeah. Some of our contributors described their childhood that they could never have imagined from their parents' voices ever seeing the city of Newark managed or run by an African American mayor. So it was the, his change of that perception. To Richard's point, one of my analogies, I hope you forgive me, you know, there were others changing perceptions. We didn't have black quarterbacks back then either. Oh, my Lord. <laughs> when Marlon Briscoe came along and started for the Denver Broncos, he was changing a perception. Yeah, black men can manage a team and run a team. I remember when Barack Obama was elected president. And that was, that was the second or third American Revolution not. And so we've got to deal with constructively the tension between people's rightful expectations and demands of government alongside the structural limitations of what is possible. What you, what you define, and you're telling us we have three minutes? <laughs> is that what you're telling us, Marsha? <laughs> oh, 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 oh. <laughs> uh, I, I think no, no, I, 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 what, I, yeah. uh, I mean, in, in the early pages, I think, Bob, maybe in your sort of earlier sort of introductory remarks, how much Newark needed help from places beyond Newark, mm -hmm. sometimes in hostile places, sure. juxtaposed to black cultural nationalism, yep. you know, which was a current running through, and it still runs through still Newark. Runs through Newark. But let wow. me give a quote that helps me summarize in one line how the challenge that faced the mayor could be expressed. Someone asked LBJ, uh, Lyndon Baines Johnson, what he thought the challenges of being the president of the United States would be. His remark was, it could be a lot worse, I could be a mayor. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that said it all. Yeah. This man believed, and I think he was probably right in some ways, that managing major cities at that time was a more challenging job. David Dinkins also points out, he says, Bob, Mayor Gibson had the same challenges I did, but think of the vast amount of resources I had in New York City as compared to what he had to work with against the same challenges here in the city of Newark. 
So LBJ, David Dinkins recognized that Ken Gibson hit a mountain of wall that he had to try to climb. And for us, having gone through this book, we think he climbed it quite well. Yeah, I, I think uh, the, the issue you raise about uh, trying to balance, gain a balance on uh, the expectations and the realities you confront um, is something we should, in fact, uh, try to get a handle on. But it's very difficult in the moment, mm -hmm. you know, because you're faced with uh, real needs. That's correct. And people mm -hmm. who do have a right to expect that things will be changed, that things will change, and that they will change markedly, and that they will change at a steady, if not rapid, pace. Uh, that's understandable. Uh, it sh it, the, the issue is how well you manage those expectations. And I believe Ken tried his best to manage those expectations. Some would say he was successful. Others might say he was less so. Well, the, the fact is now there could be you know, reasons given for this, and detractors always have reasons. Mm -hmm. But the man served for 16 years. Did, were there re-elections, or did he just re-elect <laughs> So people saw something. Yeah. yeah. What did they see? Did they see? I think in the, I think in the first two terms, uh, they saw calm reassurance that things uh, may not change quickly, but that Ken wanted to move in a positive direction, a change direction. Mm -hmm. I think in the second two terms, uh, they were less inclined uh, to see his, his term in office that way. Mm -hmm. They were increasingly concerned about his inability to change things at the new uh, public schools, about his inability to bring about economic uh, revitalization of the city. Uh, the more uh, active engagement on the part of especially the Latino community in uh, the affairs of Newark. So uh, I think that he got a bit tired in his fourth term in office. And as a consequence of that, the Newark uh, uh, populace decided that uh, perhaps new blood was, in it, was needed. Yeah, I sense we're getting close to the end of our time. But look, uh, I'm going to ask. Richard, <laughs> you, you asked a Baptist preacher to do this, so you know what I said? You asked a Baptist preacher to do this. So I, one last question, though, um, and Marsha's made, forget, made me forget my question. <laughs> that was intentional. I mean, where are we today if this is a book about the future, given what you know about this, this past, the struggle, you know, the watershed, you know about that. We could it's talk. Gone. We could talk the rest of the evening about the North Watershed. But BGO is still here. Ha ha! Right on. You know, BGO is still and here. so on. I mean, yes. Richard, you give quite a laundry list, and I sat up. Yeah. And said, wow. Right. I mean, we still struggle with the schools, but there are some things we can point to. But health but disparities where? has been greatly reduced. Health reduced. disparities, yes. Through our local health. Uh, centers that Ken built, seven or eight of them, made a huge difference. We could talk about those. Newark emergency positive, services for families. Lots of things that he did. So tell the millennials what their marching orders are <laughs> in light of. That, that's a good way to you end, gotta right? keep. You got to keep struggling. You got to keep moving forward. You build on, uh, build on the work in the past. Use it as a platform for doing those things that you know need to be done uh, to advance uh, the community's interests. Um, as we go forward. Newark Studies, does it continue Office of Newark here? Studies. Does it continue here? No, it's in a different form. Uh, but is the, that Cornwall? Or? The Cornwall Center is an attempt to replicate mm -hmm. what the Office of Newark Studies attempted to do, but it's based in the guts of Rutgers Newark, which is, which is essential uh, to, the, um, to its long-term success. Well, I would like to propose, as the chancellors here and various deans, that we have a seminar on the trilogy uh, to understand some of these things uh, so that the new leadership coming forward will have the benefit of the elders' reflections. That's a, that's a serious proposal, that we have a graduate seminar, 
freshman seminar, I'm not sure which, but bringing some time, from time to time, contributors to come in and really help younger people know mm. about Newark and how this era shines a light on the next. Mm. I, I knew Ken Gibson up close for the first time in 1984, Larry, when he chaired the state Jesse Jackson campaign. And I have to tell you, I, I, I said, man, I mean, we would sit there, we would talk about statewide strategy, and I had a good night's sleep. But there were times when I would doze off. He was soft-spoken, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and, and, but you know, we were organized. He organized us, did he not? I thought about that. And uh, I think these, uh, <laughs> now when, 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 when the great uh, uh, gospel, uh, 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 who am I talking about now? Yeah. The great gospel, uh, uh, Precious Lord. Oh. oh, we need a seminar on a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> huh? Tommy. Dorothy. Tommy. When, he, when he does that, Marsha, he's saying one more round. <laughs> That's not what you need. <laughs> anyway, let's give these men a hand and all the people who helped them. Do you, do you uh, uh, intend a few questions from the audience, yes? I think he would say to the young people today that you've got to be willing to step forward and take on the challenge of addressing uh, the issues you think need to be addressed and to do so boldly, and not to be reluctant, not to wait for someone else to step forward to do it on your behalf. You've got uh, to take the bull by the horns and uh, try to make a difference. Bob? Dean Lopez, I would say that Ken would make people understand that the role of big city mayors has changed dramatically. We don't have many nation states anymore. There aren't places where everyone mm -hmm. in the place Mitchell. looks the same. We have diverse places, and that melting pot is most seen in our cities. So in effect, our mayors have become the avatars for policy and, and politics. So national politics can evolve out of cities. It's what the people in cities see the future of America is where America is going to go. So I think mayors like Ken would say, watch me. I, I'm going to tell you where the next generations of this country needs to be because it is out of cities that the new direction for this country is going, is going to emanate. Thank you. Any other questions? Could, could I, well, since we don't have any questions. Oh, yeah, oh right. there is one. OK. Well, this, uh, oh, I got two oh, you now. You got two now. <laughs> they come really, two by two. First, then I, I, was, I didn't realize he came from the South. What role do you think his Southern yeah. upbringing uh, brought to his role as mayor? Of Newark. Not much. He came to Newark <laughs> when he was eight years old. Well, so he grew I'm talking up. about parental influence. Oh, perhaps, yeah, perhaps. Yeah. That, that may have influenced. Uh, his willingness to, to be active mm -hmm. in the civic arena um, was probably uh, uh, the residue of his uh, having come from the South and his parents having brought him from the South and their determination to make a difference both for themselves and for their community. So I assume that did have some relevance. OK, the second question is, what does his administration look like, considering he was dealing with a transition from an um, Italian administration to an African-American administration? That was one of the challenges he confronted. Uh, he also inherited a $65 million budget deficit as he walked into the mayor's office. So his attempt to bring on new hires, to bring on New employees was constrained first by that reality, and second by the reality of the civil service requirements that precluded firing people without cause and bringing on new people. So he had to figure out a way uh, to attract um, the talent that he sought in other ways. And he did it in two, in two different streams, if you will. One was to attract federal and state dollars that would allow him to employ people outside of the civil service system after having negotiated with the state to 
uh, you know, a Dave Dennison can tell you more about this than I can, but to lower the requirements or to lengthen the time frame within which people could take the civil service exam so that they could be qualified to hold the jobs that, uh, that, they, uh, that he wanted them to have. So that was internal to city government, but he also created this thing called the Office of Newark Studies that brought into the administration, although they were not city employees, they were Rutgers University employees, mm -hmm. to uh, help him formulate policies, plans, and procedures that might be, might be, um, might be helpful to the city. So he took two different streams. But, uh, may I say one word in response to what you're saying? May I? Uh, that, that point about the economy, it was interesting because you noted that the inflation at that time actually helped the mayor yeah, solve the debt problem, mm -hmm. but it hindered his capacity his to attract capital. Mm -hmm. So it was a double whammy. My favorite story in the whole book was that uh, some Italians broke into the mayor's office, broke down the door. Okay, broke down the door. He was inside, and they were armed. And if I'm not mistaken, maybe guns drawn. Uh, don't know about that, but they had guns. <laughs> but they had guns. They and had the guns. mayor was sitting behind his desk, listening to them eating grapes. I, I mean, this is uh, idiomatic of Kenneth, Kenneth Gibson's cool. Yeah, but you got to remember when when we chatted with Ken. <laughs> yeah, but you got to remember. You got to remember we when talk. we chatted with Ken for his reflections. Okay. He reminded us that yeah, he sat there he eating grapes. Fans, no, no, he had his 38 in oh, his yeah. lap. <laughs> <laughs> you should have put that in there. It's in there. Yeah, you know, I missed that. Yeah, yeah. That's a but he was cool as a cucumber under these kinds of stress. May I situations? just respond to Esther's question quickly? One of the other ways, Esther, and I can speak to it very directly that he responded to the challenge that you raised. He created three separate nonprofit profit entities. entities to manage parts of city government. Juniors can sit there and talk much more clearly about it because he was there helping to create them. HDRC, the Newark Housing Development Rehabilitation Corporation that I manage, the Newark uh, Develop NEDC, Newark Economic <laughs> Development Corporation, Al Faella's name resonates with that, and we can talk about the North Watershed Corporation, which I came back from state government to also manage, that I did two out of three. To avoid that civil service conundrum that he faced, we ran parts of city government outside. through outside nonprofit, non quasi-governmental entities. I think Diane Johnson might want to comment on that. <laughs> uh, Roger Lowenstein commented on that, that it did create a bit of a splintering effect in city government. Thank Diane, you. I think you had pointed out that it was difficult to find out where the head was. The head over here for this, there was another the head over here. But what I found was interesting, how much autonomy the mayor was willing to give each of us in each of those roles. He trusted us to take on... How old were you? Each of, oh my, right out of law school, I was very young. Uh, and he trusted us to take those roles on. And I, it probably created consternation for a person like you trying to manage us from HUD, because there were many heads. Mm -hmm. uh, and you had to help figure out. But what you said, and I thought was very important, you said while it wasn't perhaps as well organized as it might have been, you thought each of those fiefdoms, if they were that, seemed to be run honestly. And I appreciated your comment about that in the book. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Glenn, you had a question. Uh, well, my question is for you uh, to ask a little more about uh, 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 Mayor Gibson's personality. There's so much uh, emphasis on this calm demeanor, almost saintly. And uh, it left me wondering, did he have uh, some close associates that he would, to whom he could cuss out Imperiali, et cetera? <laughs> was, there an, was there another side in there? Uh, Junius, what do you have to say about that? <laughs> um, I, I, think, I think he had a few guys around him who he relied upon. I think of Elton Hill, for example, who became Harry his. Wheeler. And, Har and Harry Wheeler, absolutely. Also Harry Wheeler, yeah. um, Junius was there for a while, and he helped in that regard. But I think those were the, uh, the two principal players, Harry Wheeler and Elton Hill. Harry Wheeler was the CETA director, and uh, uh, Lieutenant Governor um, 
Sheila Oliver was his deputy for a while. How long were you there, Sheila? About four years. Four years, okay. So she knows about Harry Wheeler. Well, we don't want to leave out Larry Coggins and others who were Larry very, Coggins. very instrumental in guiding the mayor in those early, in those early years. I would like to see if uh, commentators, I mean contributors, want to add a little bit to, I think you'd agree with that, right? Sure. Yeah. Do you want to add a little additional information oh, or color? Sure. And I see one of Richard. the contributors standing now. Richard? Camarari. Sure is. Uh, again, good evening, everyone. Thank you all. Uh, I haven't had the benefit of reading the book yet, except my book. <laughs> but um, <laughs> I, I, a couple of, um, put a little bit of a point on a couple of comments. I think it is important to emphasize, re-emphasize what Richard was saying, that just because Ken got elected, we still had a neo-colonial economic dynamic, which things were controlled from the outside. We had an overwhelmingly white political infrastructure that didn't change, as, as you pointed out. So it was very difficult for Ken to do what he probably wanted to do. Um, I do think there's, you know, some of us, myself included, who thought he was a bit too cautious in his approach. Uh, I felt that in the 70s and 80s, and I was in my 20s and 30s. Of course, here's the point when I'm supposed to say, but I've changed my mind. <laughs> but I still haven't. And I do think he could have been a little less cautious in his because, again, the socioeconomic distress, mm. socioeconomics really didn't mm. move much during his four terms, except for health indicators, which yeah. clearly he deserves credit for. Mm -hmm. uh, my, my question um, is actually related to his relationship, his interaction with the female voices of the late 60s and 70s. I mean, there were you know, several, although, as usual, you know, the women kind of get short shrift in these mm -hmm. discussions. But I don't know if you want to talk about some of the women who were strong and powerful then and what Ken's relationship was with them. Why don't you name some of them? Uh, well, we, who we had? Uh, Pearl, Pearl, Pearl Beatty. People can throw them out here. Pearl Larry Beatty. Stalks. Larry Stalks. Stalks. Pearl Beatty. Um, who was the, uh, and the Thomas, the, the radio the Thomas. Um, show? Shirley. Shirley. Bernice Bass. Bernice Bass. Bernice Bass. So, radio show. Yeah. That's my question. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> we may have just said it, Richard, that they were women who had an enormous impact yeah. on, on him and the way he uh, managed things. And, and, and some of whom he had a good, positive working relationship with. Others were, it was less so, quite frankly. Yes. Well, I'm going to yield to Vincent. He was Hi. My Hi, Vincent. I'm Vincent Perez. I was a contributor. Yes. My part of the contributor was his relation to the United Community Corporation. Mm -hmm. The United Community Corporation was created in 1965 under the All Economic Opportunity Act. It was the only organization in the city. Mayor Gibson came from UCC. So never has, that's one other thing when they asked me to contribute, I would like to, because never has been a study done about UCC's contribution mm. to the movement, because we were, mm. at that time, we was the only major social service organization mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in the city of Newark. We helped to fund, for example, we helped to fund Focus and other organizations in the city. And some of the players that you mentioned were part of the UCC movement. So I was very glad that I, uh, when Richard invited me to speak about it, and I think it's something in the future you need to do some research because we were, it was the first agency mm. in the city. It as the only agency had presence in the five wards of the city and did some active, com mm, I did true. some active community organizing mm. that helped them. Because if you look into the report of the Newark riots, technically UCC was blamed. Wow. Mm. in that report that the mm -hmm. state did, mm -hmm. because it was the first organization. But this is a subject to Very be considered in that seminar, to go deeper. Yeah. Yes. Uh, really, I mean, this is vital. We can't I was very it. glad when I was invited to contribute to talk about that contribution, yeah. because I think when the Newark history comes out, yeah. that has to, that has a part of the has of never been discussed. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Yeah. Vincent, Andy, very well said. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Vincent. Well, Lieutenant I Governor. just want to comment on uh, uh, Richard because, Richard, I was going to be good and uh -oh. not comment on the fact that this discussion focused around the men that were part of the Gibson <laughs> administration. <laughs> I uh, because that. there is no doubt there were significant numbers of women that worked in City Hall that kept the trains running on time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I know as a young person coming out of graduate school and returning to Newark, I got the opportunity to be exposed to some of those women. 
Some of them were formally educated, some of them were not. Mm -hmm. But I think the thing that we should not overlook, because I heard that we didn't move the city forward economically and we did not make uh, progress in certain uh, areas, I would challenge and dispute that thinking, because what Ken Gibson did he created a black middle class in the city of Newark. Mm -hmm. He created a black middle class in this city because I heard both of you say that prior to the election of Ken Gibson, there were no African Americans working in City Hall. Right. And, and that is absolutely the truth. But when <clears throat> Ken Gibson became the mayor, there was not an office in City Hall or those extensions of City Hall that were out in the community that were not staffed by African American people yeah. and Latino people as well. So I think, and then this, this, uh, the I like the question from the law school, uh, Lopez. Uh, Ken Gibson's reach was further than Newark. I know that personally. He became the head of the U.S. Conference of Mayors, and he used that platform to coalesce with mayors all around the country who were in the same boat that he was in. And he did, they did form brain trusts and think tanks. And I can recall that when Coleman Young was mayor of, uh, of, uh, of Detroit, Detroit mm -hmm. he brought parts of his staff from Newark, including myself, and we were, stayed holed up in rooms writing papers and authoring applications to bring resources into those cities. So I don't want us to leave here today thinking that Ken Gibson did not have economic impact because many of us who are characterized as the generation or the mortar or you know however you know Sharp described it we would not have emerged as leaders in Newark had it not been for Ken Gibson's administration. We, okay. we agree. We agree with that. Absolutely. And, and <laughs> you do touch upon this. Yeah, a bit. Yeah, you touch yeah. upon this. Yeah. But I think, like <clears throat> other subjects, the depth of Ken's reach beyond Newark has got to be a part of the seminar. Mm -hmm. It's touched upon in the book. <laughs> the conference of mayors, the interaction with Stokes and those guys, those guys, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it's all documented. But we need to go deeper, especially in light of ongoing experience. We've had more mayors. Mm -hmm. Maybe the female mayor of Atlanta is benefiting from something mm -hmm. Ken got started. We need to explore that. And, and I hope the academicians are picking up on my recommendation. <laughs> I am, after all, a former <laughs> Board of Governors <laughs> guy. We have our last question right here. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, Lieutenant you. Governor, for bringing up the ladies here. <laughs> uh, always powerful, always there at the ta if we're there at the table. Um, I was noting, and maybe this is a figment of my imagination, because I, I was out during that same time period, but it seems like there were a lot of 20-somethings and maybe early 30-something at the table. I mean, I think we felt like we had a bigger seat at the table. You know, is that a figment, or were there, as a younger generation, <clears throat> have a little more clout, a little more seat at the table, listen to a little more, while perhaps the next generation some, you know, kind of stood back. Yeah, I, I think I made the point during, during, okay. during my remarks that one of the things that Ken uh, should be given more credit for is having brought yeah. into his administration and around him uh, people who were in their mid to late 20s and early 30s and who were given substantial uh, mm. substantive responsibilities. Bob Holmes and uh, Jack Kroskoff and Richard Roper and a whole of, group of uh, people like uh, uh, Jerome Jerry. Harris and mm -hmm. George Hampton, mm -hmm. uh, Junius Williams and Dave Dennison, all in their 30s, late 30s, mid 30s, if you will. Junius was about 50 then. No, 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 he wasn't 50 then. <laughs> <laughs> so you're saying we should be looking at replicating that? Absolutely. 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 Thank you for that. Thank you. Well, yes. in conjunction with that, oh, I think go. this thing that you are just referencing now, the young people involved and so on, I looked at this, not to say putting aside other forms of struggle, but this was a new chapter. Yep. Taking mm -hmm. over city government in a major American city, or American cities, this was the next wave. And I thought about that, Richard, when I saw Don Harris's name. Mm -hmm. Because Don Harris is straight out of SNCC. Now, he's a mm -hmm. Rutgers guy, but he walked, uh, he, he, 
duck bullets with me in southwest Georgia. Uh, there, are so, two, there are two Don Harris's. One is in here, uh, and the other is in Sarasota, one, Florida. The one yeah, down the, in Florida. Your, your Don Harris is in Sarasota. Right, yeah. right, right. So it's interesting. And Junius came to Newark out of the uh, Northern Student Movement, right? And SNCC uh, orientation. Yep. Yep. Yeah, yep, so this yes. is like a, a different uh, chapter mm -hmm. in the ongoing struggle. Yep. Uh, and what is that struggle today, right? That's the question. It's a question for the seminar. <laughs> I'm going to stop us here again. I just want to thank all of thank you, Lieutenant Governor, but thank you all, Robert Holmes, Pleasure. Richard Roper, Reverend Dr. Howard, for sharing your time with us and your knowledge. Thank you again so much.